I'm Ann Spinney of the Music Department and the Irish Studies Program here at Boston College, and I work with Seamus Connolly um, with uh, the Irish music courses and the Celtic music courses that we have here. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for coming here this weekend and sharing with us your scholarship, your experiences, and your insights of uh, Patrick Kavanaugh. Part of the legacy that Kavanaugh left us are poems that have made great songs. And we're very fortunate in having here today one of the great interpreters of songs, one of the great ballad singers, Danny Doyle from Dublin. Um, Mr. Doyle's presentation is called The Gleeman Sing, The Stories and Songs of Yeats, Joyce, O'Casey, Behan, and Kavanaugh. And I should mention there'll be a reception afterwards right outside, hosted by Isolde Moylan, the Consul General of Ireland, and thanks very much. Um, Danny has already introduced himself very well to you, but uh, perhaps I could just remind you that he was part of the scene that was, has been called the folk revival in Irish music. Um, tells me he made his first recording in 1966. Um, so some of us have grown up listening to his voice. It's a classic voice. Um, we're very fortunate in America that he came to live over here. He's been called an international treasure, shared between the two nations. Danny Doyle, as you have heard already, sings all kinds of songs. Um, when he sings the classic songs, even the old chestnuts, he has a rare and wonderful ability to make them expressive and real um, and fresh. And you've already experienced some of that. You'll experience more of that in the program. And I'd like to also point out there are CDs for sale uh, out uh, in the event uh, outside the hall here. Um, also, so that you can experience Danny's wonderful voice, we want to remind you about cell phones and beepers and things like that. You'll want to turn them on after we're done here today. Please join me then in welcoming Danny Doyle. Thank you, Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, my old friend Seamus Connolly called me some time ago and asked me to come up and do something at the... Uh, Patrick Kavanagh seminar, uh, sing Patrick songs I said, and tell a few Patrick stories. I said, I can do that. But uh, to my best of my knowledge, uh, uh, Kavanagh only wrote two songs. Uh, so I told Seamus it would be a very short program. Well, he said, you know, what do, what do you suggest? So I suggested that um, many of the writers wrote songs. Yeats wrote songs. Uh, Joyce wrote songs. Sean O'Casey, the Dublin playwright, wrote songs. Uh, Kavanagh wrote a couple of songs, and Brendan Bean wrote many songs. Probably O'Casey wrote more songs than any of them. Uh, we can't do them all today, obviously, but we'll do a few of them. So, it's called, I call it the Glee Men Sing, for the simple reason that Yeats uh, used the, the word Glee Man uh, to describe a very, very uh, famous Dublin ballad singer, early 19th century ballad singer called Michael Moran, who wrote marvellous songs under the pen name of Zosimus. And uh, he wrote an article about him, and he called him the Glee Man. And the definition of a Glee Man is uh, really a wandering minstrel, and then it evolved uh, to include, uh, say, barbershop quartets. Now, our quintet today never, ever performed together, but uh, they gave us much mirth and glee, so we're going to call them Glee Men. Um, I just finished writing this a few days ago, so I haven't had time to memorize it. You will see me glancing at my notes. I hope you'll forgive me for that. And we'll start off uh, chronologically uh, and we'll begin with Yeats. Uh, when w William Butler Yeats was born in Dublin, 1865, uh, the, de the delivering doctor uh, pronounced him a fine, strong baby that, quote, could be left out on the windowsill all night and it would do him no harm. And indeed, uh, uh, this fellow was no Dr. Spock, I can tell you. But the hardy infant uh, would grow to a fortitude that would carry him to the insecurity attendant upon one who travelled the road of the professional poet in the late 19th century. As a boy, Yeats would spend his summers amongst vivid, colourful County Sligo characters. Uh, the landscape of that county making an indelible impression upon him. But he would do what few writers have done. He impressed himself so vividly on Sligo that it is forever after known as Yeats' country. He rediscovered our ancient mythology, poetry and folklore 
and came to delight in Celtic mysticism and the pagan tradition. He claimed that even his dreams were pagan. Yeats had discovered our buried folk tradition that had flourished 500 years before the birth of Christ, uh, surviving in the cottages of the west of Ireland, uh, despite the many attempts to exterminate it. He set about articulating it into some of the finest literature of the 20th century. At his Abbey Theatre in Dublin, the romantic glow of his productions startled the Irish racial memory out of sleep. The plays, based on the ancient sagas and folk tales, were seen as prescient allegories of the coming struggle, impelling men and women to the barricades in the rebellion in Dublin in 1916. But it seems our great poet had a constantly distracted and absent-minded air about him, and even when dining, uh, it is reported, he was utterly impervious to what he ate. Once in a restaurant, when he had finished his dinner, he asked for a menu and ordered another, completely forgetting he had already eaten. Once during the, the dessert course, he was given parsnips by mistake. He said, this is very peculiar pudding. He would absentmindedly put sugar in his soup and salt in his coffee. He also had something of the other world about him. Uh, he strode through Dublin with his head in a cloud of ideas, talking, singing in his eerie manner and wrestling, wrestling with abstractions. He floated down the streets like something dreamed into existence and out of the tussle with himself came marvellous poetry. One of his poems is The Fiddler of Dooney and I've always felt it was uh, ready-made to be set to an air. So that's what I've done. Like a wave on the sea My cousin is priest in Kilvarnet My brother at Makarabui I passed my brother and cousin They read in their books of prayer I read in my book of songs That I bought at the Sligo Fair For the good are always the merry Saved by an evil chance And the merry love the fiddle And the merry love to dance When we come at the end of time To Peter sitting in state He'll smile on the three old spirits That call me first through the gates And when the folk there spy me They will all come up to me With here is the fiddler of Juni And dance like a wave on the sea for the good are always the merry Save by an evil chance And the merry long the fiddle And the merry long to dance When I play on my fiddle in duty Folks dance like a wave on the sea My cousin is priest in Kilvarnet, my brother at Makarabui. For the good are always the merry, saved by an evil chance, and the merry long the fiddle, the merry long to dance. For the good are always the merry. Saved by an evil chance And the merry long the fiddle And the merry 
Yeats became obsessed and fell into unrequited love with an extraordinary beauty uh, called Maud Gone, the daughter of an aristocratic family who would spend her entire life in revolutionary activity. Uh, she told him uh, she could never marry him, uh, yet he wrote plays and poems for her, making her the wellspring of his inspiration. When he complained that life without her was unbearable, she told him, you are making beautiful poetry out of what you call your unhappiness, and you're happy in that. He wrote one of his loveliest poems for her. It's called, When You Are Old. When you are old and grey and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once, and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace, and loved your beauty with love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you, and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled, and paced upon the mountains overhead, and hid his face among a cloud of stars. Yeats continued to pursue Maud Gone, but again and again she refused him. He wrote, I might as well have offered devotion to an image in a milliner's window or a statue in a museum. Yeats was, as I suppose uh, poets need to be, a practical man. Uh, the editor of a Dublin newspaper rang him late one evening in 1923 uh, to tell him that he had just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Now, the man was almost incoherent with excitement, talking about the great honour to Ireland and the great honour to Yeats, when Yeats interrupted him by saying, For Christ's sake, man, get a hold of yourself. How much do I get? The sum was about £8,000, a very considerable one at the time. And when Yates and his wife had gotten over their excitement, they searched the house for a bottle of wine with which to celebrate. When none could be found, they put the frying pan on the stove and uh, cooked up some celebratory pork sausages instead. Mind you, they were Hafner sausages, the best sausages in Dublin. When reading Yeats, uh, you might think, you might conclude that he was a singer or a musician. So uh, rhythm drunk is his verse. Although he claimed to be conscious of uh, tunes when he wrote, he was in fact tone deaf. Uh, when visiting a friend, he heard a piano playing in another room. He asked the friend, is that a violin or a cello playing? And you certainly get that uh, rhythm drunk feeling in his wonderful poem, The Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now, and go to Inish Free, and the small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow, and evening full of linnet's wings. I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. This is one of Yeats's uh, songs. It's very lovely. It's called Down by the Sally Gardens. Down by the 
sunny gardens my love and I did meet. She passed the sunny gardens with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the trees. Ah, but I, being young and foolish, with her could not agree. In a field all by the river, my love and I did stand. And on my leaning shoulder, she laid her snow-white hand. She bid me take love easy, as the grass grows on the wind. Ah, but I, being young and foolish, and now I'm full of tears. Down by the sally gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the sally gardens on little snow-white feet. She bid me take life easy as the leaves grow on the trees. Ah, but I was young and foolish with her could not agree. Ah, but I was young and foolish and now I'm full of tears. Thanks very much. Thank you. Turning old and grey, uh, Yeats put pen to paper and wrote his epitaph. Under bare Ben Bulban's head in Drumcliff Churchyard, Yeats is laid. An ancestor was rector there long years ago. A church stands near by the road, an ancient cross. No marble, no conventional phrase on limestone quarried near the spot. By his command, these words are cut. Cast a cold eye on life, on death, horseman pass by. I wonder what that means. If you have any ideas, please tell me later. We come now to James Joyce. Uh, Joyce and Yeats knew each other somewhat. Uh, Yeats was walking down the street one day in Dublin and uh, a young man stopped him to have a conversation. And uh, the young man asked Joyce how old he was, uh, I mean, asked Yates how old he was, and Yates said he was 43 or something like that. And the young man, a very impertinent 19-year-old James Joyce, said to him, he said, you're too old to be influenced by me, goodbye, and walked away. Yates apparently was uh, quite impressed by the impertinence. <laughs> but anyway, uh, one of the giants of the Irish literary revival went into exile in 1904 to live in Europe. Europe. Twenty years later, James Joyce, living in Zurich, when asked, do you miss Dublin, replied, I never left it. Joyce was a good, if erratic, student, a tall, swaggering, bored, angry, intellectually exceptional, impoverished young man in hand-me-down clothes. He was very sure of himself and insistent upon recognition of his talents. Uh, he was exuberant, quick-tongued, full of gaiety, and a fine singer, a very fine singer, with a repertoire of hundreds of songs. At parties he would glide up and down uh, the room with a hat, cane, and eyeglass in the manner of an old vaudevillian uh, artist singing. 
As I walked along the Boab line with an independent air, you could hear the girls declare, he must be a millionaire. You can hear them sigh and wish to die. You can see them wink with the other eye at the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo. He loved those kind of songs. He wrote parodies on many of them. Unfortunately, uh, if you don't know the original songs, the parodies don't seem to work, in my opinion. He also loved silly little, little ditties like this one. Is your mother in Molly Malone? Molly cried, she's out. Is your father in Molly Malone? Molly cried, he's out. Then may I come in by the fireside and sit all alone with you? Molly said with a smile, hold your tongue for a while. Sure, the fire's out too. Joyce grew up in a, an era of severe sexual repression, and like many another, he resorted to the bawdy houses around Montgomery Street in the slums of Dublin, or Night Town, as he called it. In the brothels, when his various appetites had been assuaged, uh, James would drink the rotgut whiskey uh, being sold by the madams, and when he was sufficiently tipsy, he would perform his favourite vaudeville song a vaudevillian song that's now gone into the canon of Irish traditional music it was actually written in England by an Englishman we won't hold that against it anyway it's got a great chorus you might sing it with me Hubert goes whack pull the dad out and steal your partner's wealth the floor your trotters shake wasn't it the truth they told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake this is a mouthful, I know. Just give me the rhythm in that case. And you start clapping on the word whack and finish on the word wage, and the 16 claps altogether, you can't possibly go wrong. Now, it's a song about a, a Dublin man, uh, a, a builder's labourer, and he had to go up the, the top of a high scaffolding one day with a load of bricks on his shoulder, and he got dizzy, uh, probably from the effects of the night before. He slipped, fell uh, on his head, um, now, I will admit, the ground did break his fall, but unfortunately it was too far away to be of any benefit. So the, they held his wake, and this is what happened. Tim Finnegan lived in Watland Street. I'm a gentleman Irish, though mighty odd. He'd a beautiful brogue, so rich and sweet, and to rise in the world he carried the hod. Tim had a sort of a tippler's way, with the love for the liquor he was born. And to help him along with his work each day, get the hands ready, he'd uh, tear up with the crater every morn. Whack for the dad who danced to your partner, but the floor you trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they told you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. Oh, very impressive. One morning Tim felt rather full. Now his head felt heavy, it made him shake. He fell off the ladder and he cracked his skull. So they carried him home, his corpse to wake. They rolled him up in a nice clean sheet and they laid him out upon the bed. They put 14 candles around his feet and a bottle of whiskey at his head. Back for the dad who danced to your part, but the floor you trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they tell you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's wake. His friends assembled at the wake. Mrs. Finnegan called out for the lunch. Well, first they brought in tea and cake, some pipes, tobacco and whiskey punch. Then Biddy O'Brien began to cry. Such a neat, clean corpse did you ever see. Yarra Tim of Ornien, why this is I. Ah, shut your mouth, says Biddy McGee. What for the dad who danced to your part but the floor you trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they tell you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. Then Peggy O'Connor took up the job. Our Biddy said she, you're wrong, I'm sure. But Biddy gave her a belt and a gob, which left her sprawling on the floor. It was then the war did soon engage. It was woman to woman and man to man. Shalala la, it was all the rage. And uh, row and the ruction soon began. Back for the dad out as the apartment, but the floor you trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they tell you? Not the fun at Finnegan's wake. Then Mickey Mulvaney, he ducked his head. When a bottle of whiskey flew at him, it missed. And landing on the bed, the liquor marinated him. 
him revives. See how he's rising. And Timothy jumping from the bed. Rise, whirl your whiskey round like blazes. Be the thunder and Jesus, do you think I'm dead? What will the dad do? That's to your part of the floor, your trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they told you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's wake. What will the dad do? That's to your part of the floor, your trotter shake. Wasn't it the truth they told you? Lots of fun at Finnegan's wake. Oh. Nice rhythm. Catholic, obviously. The one we like the best. Nora Barnacle was uh, the red-haired, earthy Galway woman who fell in love and rushed into exile with James Joyce, a man she hardly knew. Nora was a hotel chambermaid and cared little uh, for literature, uh, but her directness and robust sensuality attracted Joyce, and she gave him faithfulness and constantly nurtured his life and art. When Joyce's father heard her name, Barnacle, he said, Oh, Jesus, I suppose you'll stick to him anyway. <laughs> In his book, Ulysses, Joyce immortalized his drab, squalid city as no other has ever been. Recalling one day of his youth, June 16, 1904, he turned the eventlessness of everyday life into sublime literature, showing us that the universal is in the particular and the local. His masterpiece is filled with the marrow bone of Dublin. It is huge, meandering, comic and carnal. Uh, this, uh, the ballad of Perse O'Reilly, uh, well, I, I wouldn't have to tell you it's from Finnegan's Wake because it has all of that convoluted uh, language that Joyce absolutely loved. The ballad of Perse O'Reilly. It's a hell of a mouthful to sing, but I'll do my best. Have you heard about one Humpty Dumpty? How he fell with a roll and a rumble Tied up like Lord Oliver Crumple At the back of the magazine wall The magazine wall Hump, helmet and all He was one time the king of our castle Now he's kicked about like a rotten old parsnip And from Green Street he'll be sent Be author of his worship To the penal jail of Mount Joy To the jail of Mount Joy Jail him with joy Sweet bad luck on the waves washed to our island, the hooker of the Hammerfest Viking, and God's curse on the day when Eblana Bay saw his black and tan man of war, saw his man of war on the harbour bar. He was jouting by Wellington's monument, our notorious hippopotamons, when some bugger let down the backstrap of his omnibus, and he caught his debt of fusiliers with his rent in his rears, give him six years. Then we'll have a free trade gales band and mass meeting for the sod, the brave son of Scandinavery, and we'll bury him down in Oxmanstown, along with the deaf and dumb Danes, with the deaf and dumb Danes, and all their remains. I'm glad he didn't write too many songs. I often wonder, is James Joyce laughing in his grave at the hullabaloo that has grown up around him and how, and how time and mania have turned him into an industry? Uh, his books, I don't think read, but rather studied. He must find it hilarious that hundreds of tomes have been written about him and uh, Joycean thesis churned, churned out by the hundreds every year. I wonder that he, does he find it amusing that every word of Ulysses has been cross-indexed, contextualized, and etymologized. Would he be bothered taking part in the yearly Bloomsday celebration in Dublin every June 19th? Would he even recognize Dublin for uh, the, the city that he recorded with such incredible detail, abundant detail, in his book Ulysses, was pre-motor car, it was pre-tram car, pre-cinema, pre-telephone, it was pre-everything. It's young and old men, it's women and girls, constantly talked of operas, plays, arias, poetry and songs and literature. The city was oral as no other in Western Europe was. And 
Even today in Ireland, there is still an ambivalence about Joyce's writings. Many consider him a silly old windbag. And I know when we were younger, uh, before I grew up to, to learn to love his r r writings, we called his book useless. An American reporter from the Washington Post, actually, uh, went to Dublin last June uh, to report on the Bloomsday activities. As he walked along Sandy Cove Beach, south of Dublin, he saw this uh, grey-haired woman walking her dog, and he stopped her and asked her for directions uh, to the James Joyce Museum. She gave him a disparaging look and said, Oh, don't tell me you're caught up in all this silly craze over Joyce, too. He's way overblown, period. And besides, he probably didn't write all those books by himself. Can you not think of something more interesting to do while you're in Dublin? The reporter said, no, ma'am, I can't. She said, oh, you needn't be no mamming me. Bloody well get on with it then. I'm sure Joyce would have gotten a, a, a laugh out of that. This is a song called Finnegan, Are You Really Dead? It was not written by Joyce, written by two friends of mine in Dublin. And uh, one is Gerald Davis, a, J a Joycean scholar and a reenactor. And the other is a dear friend of mine, uh, a television producer um, and uh, presenter called Shea Healy. As I walked out through Dublin City early on a fine spring morn My thoughts were slowly turned to Joyce and to the town where he was born What would he think of Dublin now? The muse sang softly in my head Ah sure he was the queer one, all the diddle yeah with that Finnegan are you really dead? The whole Atlas Street is cold and shuttered. Leopold Bloom is always home. Down Sackville Street, Plum Stately Buck, and Blazes Boyle and Spectres roam. Sweet Anne Olivia flows to the sea, past Molly Bloom's immortal bed. Asher, he was the queer one, all the diddle yeah with that. Finnegan, are you really dead? Down along by Sandy Mount, the seagulls wheel and cry. Young Stephen sees eternity crush out before his eye. And far beyond is exile that's calling him away. Far from his tower of Sandy Cove, hard fast. By Dublin Bay And like the seagulls high above The thought spin through his mind He soars above the city streets That soon he leave behind He's blind to what he loves of her He thinks he'll shake her free even in a far-off land, a Dumbliner he'll be. As I went out through Dublin City, as the sun was going down, scenes and pictures from his stories filled my head with sights and sounds. Ah, Dublin, how your son has served you All across the world his words are read Ah, sure he was the queer one for the diddle yeah with that Finnegan, are you really dead? Ah, sure he was the queer one for the diddle yeah with that Finnegan, are you really dead? The Dublin that Sean O'Casey was born into presented 
uh, the most extraordinary contrast in poverty and magnificence. Uh, the once fashionable Georgian mansions built uh, for the 18th century aristocrats now housed one third of the city's population, each house sheltering as many as 100 people, one family per room. Uh, the death rate in this quarter of the city uh, was the highest in Europe. In fact, it was greater than even that of Moscow or Calcutta. But be behind the once stately, now crumbling facades, there was life and anger and defiance of unjust authority. Out of these slums came a hobnail-booted socialist and lyric genius, Sean O'Casey. Playwriter and uh, songwriter, O'Casey, following in Yeats's footsteps, would become the new master of the Abbey Theatre. His plays, The Shadow of a Gunman, The Plough and the Stars, and Juno and the Peacock, are bursting with humanity. Uh, they are savagely and bitterly funny. His characters inhabit inhabiting an impoverished yet vigorous world. O'Casey created many characters, but none richer or as many-sided as himself. He was always spoiling for intellectual battle, uh, even going so far as to cultivate grievances for the purpose. He fell out with absolutely everybody. Eventually he fell out with his country, and like Joyce, he left it, never to return. But for all his bitterness, he became a great comic writer and turned the ferocious, dark inequalities and passions of his time into great art. He witnessed uh, the beginning of the rebellion in Ireland. It really started in 1913, when the Dublin working class, uh, who were essentially slaves, decided they could take no more. And uh, in his marvellous autobiographies, O'Casey wrote, A new shouting was soon to be heard in Dublin in 1913. Discontent had let a, lit, lit a blazing bonfire and out of the festering tenements that rag and bone shop of the human heart swarmed a hunger agitated and ragged army of slaves. Too often stricken they now struck back. They called a general strike but all the agitation and expectation would amount to nothing because the intransigent masters of Dublin, the employers declared, let them submit or starve. In Dublin City in 1913, the boss was boss and employed a slave. The woman worked and the child went hungry and along came black and like a mighty wave. The worker cringed when the boss man thundered. Seventy hours was his weekly chore. He'd ask for little and less was granted. Lest given little, he might ask for more. In the month of August, the boss man told us no union man for him could work. We stood by Lark and we told the boss man to fight to starve, we would not shirk. Eight months we fought and eight months we starved, we followed Lark and through thick and thin. But hungry homes and crying children, they broke our hearts and we could not win. After eight months of riots, street battles and picketing and some deaths, the men, broken by the hunger of their wives and children, were forced to sign a pledge renouncing the union. They had asked for little and less was granted, lest given little they might ask for more. Radical nationalists in Ireland now began to plan a rebellion for Easter 1916, in the third person, uh, Sean O'Casey wrote, Kathleen E. Houlihan, Mother Ireland, was winding the clock of rebellion. Once again, the martial tramping of feet was echoing. O'Casey heard the drums under the window and with multitudes of men and women stepped out onto the broad, crowded highway of Irish nationalism. As they marched, they sang his song. <laughs> This is an O'Casey song called The Grand Old Dame Britannia. A satire, I suppose. I sing, Ireland, I'm so proud of you. You sing, said the Grand Old Dame Britannia, and poor little Belgium tried and true, said the Grand Old Dame Britannia. No problem. 
Oh, Ireland, I'm so proud of you, said the grand old dame, Britannia, and poor little Belgium, tried and true, said the grand old dame, Britannia. You've closed your ears to the Sinn Féin lies, you know every gale that for England dies. He'll enjoy home rule in the clear blue sky, said the grand old dame, Britannia. Ah, the castle's now an altered place, said the grand old dame, Britannia. It's the drawing room of the Irish race, said the grand old dame, Britannia. John Redmond to the throne is bowed with a chanting, cheering Irish crowd. Ah, sure, it's like the days of Shane the Proud, said the grand old dame, Britannia. John Redmond, now home rule has won, said the grand old dame Britannia. He's finished, what wolf tone be gone, said the grand old dame Britannia. Yet rebels through the country stock, shouting 67 and bachelors walk. Did you ever hear such foolish talk, said the grand old dame Britannia. Ah, scholars, parlors, saints and bards, said the grand old dame Britannia. Come along and list in the Irish guards, said the grand old dame Britannia. Each man that treads on German feet will be given a parcel tied up neat. Of a tombstone cross and a winding sheet, said the grand old dame Britannia. Oh, Ireland, I'm so proud of you, said the grand old dame Britannia. And poor little Belgium, tried and true, said the grand old dame Britannia. You've closed your ears to the Sinn Féin lies, for you know every gale that for England dies. He'll enjoy home rule in the clear blue skies, said the grand old dame Britannia. Thanks for joining in. On Easter Monday 1916, the Dublin City Church bells struck noon, the signal for the rebellion. Outside the General Post Office in Sackville Street, Patrick Pearce read the Proclamation of Independence. Now, the historic moment was only slightly uh, marred by an incident that happened just up the street. Just up the street, a tipsy bowler-hatted gentleman was urinating against the wall of a closed public lavatory. He shouted, Ah, Jesus, at last we have a republic. We can do what we like. A British warship sailed up the Liffey and uh, began to shell the rebel positions. By the end of the week, Dublin looked like a town in war-ravaged Belgium. But the gamble was lost, and the 16 leaders uh, stepped out for death. Fourteen of them executed in the execution yard in Kilmainham Jail of Dublin, uh, one executed in the Tower of London, and one executed in Cork. O'Casey wrote, Listen, listen all, a volley, another, and another. What Irish heart is thrilled now by the eagle's whistle? Of the notes of the cuckoo calling summer closer. What foot now will move merry to the strings of a violin? The guns suddenly give forth a jet of flame, and another, still holding Ireland by her rough but graceful hand, bids farewell to the world. Our old friend William Butler Gates wrote, Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed Utterly, a terrible beauty is born. In 1917, when he was 37 and she was 22, O'Casey fell in love with a girl called Mary Keating, a very good-looking girl with soft eyes. He would mail poems and love letters to her twice a day. And by October of that year, she fell seriously ill, and when it seemed she might not uh, pull through, miserable and sick at heart, Anticipating the loss of his true love, O'Casey wrote this achingly bleak song. In it he calls her Maggie. The song is called Since Maggie Went Away. No more I stroll, no more I stroll 
along the boring. Or see the scarlet poppies flame amidst the corn green. No more beneath the hedge I'll watch the butterflies at play. For me heart is filled with woe, with woe, since Maggie went away. The sweet wild rose, the sweet wild rose, that loved to see us there, and seemed to bid us hope, now droops and tells me to despair. The linnet sings his song unheard, perched on a leafy spray, and my heart is filled with woe, with woe, since Maggie went away. The gentle flowers, the gentle flowers, their happy charm has fled, and now they seem like blossoms strewn above the silent dead. Their symbols now of sorrow deep and life's swift sure decay. And my heart is filled with woe, with woe, since Maggie went away. Then welcome grief, then welcome grief, man's warm, true-hearted friend. For though all things be false, thou still art faithful to the end. And now I'll walk alone with thee till life turns into clay. For me heart is filled with woe, with woe, since Maggie went away. Ah, me heart is filled with woe, with woe, since Maggie went away. Thank you. Thanks very much. O'Casey's masterful plays were enormously successful and are still performed around the world to this very day. When Yeats's Abbey Theatre rejected his new work, The Silver Tassie, O'Casey, with his persecution complex in high dudgeon, uh, left the country and never came back. In one of his last letters, he wrote what might uh, well or easily serve as his epitaph. I have found life an enjoyable, enchanting, active, and sometimes terrifying experience. A lament in one ear, maybe, but always a lovely song in the other. Speaking of lovely songs, this is another one of uh, Casey's uh, song from one of his plays. Violets were sent in the woods, Nora displaying their charms to the bee. When I first said I loved only you, Nora, and you said you loved. Only me The chestnut blooms gleam Through the glade Nora A robin sang loud On a tree When I first said I loved only you Nora, and you said you loved only me. The golden robe daffodils shone. Nora, 
and danced in the breeze from the leaf. When I first said I loved only you, Nora, and you said you loved only me. And bees sang a song, Nora, of happier transports to be. When I first said I loved only you, Nora, and you said you loved only me. Chestnut blooms gleam through the glade, Nora. A robin sang loud from a tree. When I first said I loved only you, Nora, and you said you. Only me. Thank you. Patrick Kavanagh and Brendan Bean were my neighbours in Dublin, and I knew them somewhat. Well, as much as a young teenage boy can know such complicated people, but Kavanagh, uh, as you know, came from County Monaghan, and would become one of Ireland's uh, greatest poets after William Butler Yeats. Brendan Bean from Dublin's inner city would achieve uh, international fame and notoriety with his gritty plays. Now, Patrick or Paddy, as we call him. Paddy and Brendan were friends in the beginning, but when they later became enemies, it was distressful、uh, to hear them, often hear them,、uh, shouting the most awful insults at each other across the street.、Um, Kavanagh, when it came to swearing, was in the genius class. He had the most unbelievable barnyard expressions you ever heard. I couldn't possibly even tell you the mildest of them. And、uh, I w- he would call across the street to, to Brendan Bean when they hated each other. He would call across. He say, "You are evil incarnate," in that Monaghan accent. "You are evil incarnate." I can't tell you what Bean shouted back because it's very vulgar. But anyway, maybe in private I'll tell you. But before they be, be, before they became enemies, they were actually friends and would go drinking together. Now it was the custom in those times.、Uh, they were generally broke, but whoever had the money bought the drinks. And Brendan, who was a house painter by trade,、uh, had finished a big house painting job and had a pile of money in his pocket. So he invited Kavanagh to go on a drinking spree the next day, and he he said he would hire a car and a driver. That would save them have the trouble of walking between pubs. It would save time, and they could get in more drinking. So late that night, about eleven o'clock, they've been drinking now for about. Twelve hours. They find themselves in a pub on the north side of Dublin city,、uh, near Glasnevin Cemetery, and they are quite drunk. And Cavanagh、uh, says to Brendan, "Brendan, look over your shoulder. You see that little man sitting by the door in the dark overcoat and the soft hat." Brendan says, "What about him?" He says, "I think he's following us." I have an idea he's following us. I saw him in the last four or five pubs we've been in. So Brendan jumps off the stool, rushes over, grabs the poor man by the scruff of the neck, pushes him up against the wall, and says, "Okay, what's your? What are you up to? Why are you following us? Come on, out with us, out with us!" And the man says, "Ah,、oh, Jesus, Mister B, and go easy. I'm your driver." <laughs> 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 
When Brendan was 16 years of age in 1939, he took the boat to Liverpool to take part in a bombing campaign. Now, he was inspired in this by his grandmother, Furlong, who had gone to England previously to blow up Buckingham Palace and the House of Parliament. Uh, just before the police nabbed her, thankfully, uh, she managed to hide a couple of sticks of jellic night down her bosom, and she became highly indignant when the, the police refused uh, to accept her explanation that the jellic night was Peggy's leg. Now, Peggy's leg is the Irish name for a stick of peppermint candy. At age 77, Granny Furlong was sentenced to three years imprisonment. Uh, Brendan, too, thankfully, was caught before he could uh, commit any outrage. And after his time in prison, he said he found it utterly impossible to ever hate Englishmen again. He said he loved them, uh, they were kind and generous and decent, the ones he met in jail, that is. And uh, he, he would often sing this song. He would view his um, revolutionary activities in a humorous vein and was later... Uh, Glad he had been caught before anything awful happened. When first I went to London in the year of 39, ah, the city looked so wonderful, the girls were so divine. But the cops, they got suspicious and they soon gave me the knock. I was charged with being the owner of an old alarm clock. Next morning down at Marybone, I caused no little store. The ARP were busy and the telephones did bore. Said the judge, I'm going to charge you with the possession of this machine. And I'm also going to charge you with the wearing of the green. I said to him, your honor, if you give me half a chance, I'll show you how me small machine can make the policeman dance. It ticks away politely till you get an awful shock. Till it takes away the jellic night in the old alarm clock. Well, the judge, he takes a look at me and says, See here, my man, for you and all your country, I don't give one damn. The only time you'll take is mine, ten years in Dartmoor Dock. You can count it by the ticking of your old alarm clock. Well, me cell, it isn't pretty and it isn't very big. This lonely Dartmoor prison would put many in the jigs. I'd long ago have left it, if only I had guts. A couple of sticks at jelly night, and me old alarm clock. Patrick Cavanaugh was a morning writer, lonely, without a penny in his pocket. He would spend the remainder of the day rambling the town, trying to kill the long, boring afternoons and evenings, gazing longingly at the goods on display in the bookshops and cafes, or lying on the grassy bank of the Grand Canal, dreaming of a pint of Guinness or a taste of whiskey. His rough, uncouth appearance masked exceptional intellectual gifts. He looked like a lanky scarecrow, scruffy, ungainly, hardly washed with shabby clothes and dirty fingernails. I would often see him shambling along Baggett Street like a farmer behind a plough, talking loudly to himself, his mercurial, volatile temper always on the verge of exploding. Despite frequent displays of misogyny, Kavanagh craved the company of young women. A few, uh, those of a literary bent, found him fascinating. But he could be terribly blunt and hurtful. Uh, once in a bar, he, he got talking to this young lady, a uh, university student, and in the midst of the conversation, he ordered himself a drink. Now, the young lady became very offended that he had not bought her a drink. So she used a very, very Dublin expression to, to show her disapproval. She said, can you not see I have a mouth on me? To which he replied, How could I miss it? And it's swinging between your two ears like a skipping rope. He fell in love with a, a beautiful young college student who admired Kavanagh the poet, but declined the awkward advances of Kavanagh the unwashed. 
Uh, the rejection inspired what is, in my opinion, the most beautiful song of unrequited love in the English language on Raglan Road. He met her first and knew That her dark hair would weave a snare That I might one day rue I saw the danger Yet I walked along the enchanted way and I said, let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. On Grafton Street in November, we trip lightly along the ledge of a deep ravine where can be seen the true wharf of passion's pledge The queen of hearts still baking tarts And I not making hay Oh, I loved too much And by such, by such Is happiness thrown away I gave her gifts of the mind I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists who have known the true gods of sound and stone and ward and tint I did not stint for I gave her poems to say With her own name there And her own dark hair Like clouds over fields of May On a quiet street where all ghosts meet I see her walking now Away from me so hurriedly My reason must allow That I had wooed not as I should A creature made of clay When the angel woos the clay he loses his wings at the dawn of day Thanks very much. While Kavanagh was ploughing his lonely, poetic furrow, Brendan Bean in the early 1950s was achieving a fame and notoriety that would eventually destroy him when his plays The Queer Fella and The Hostage became international sec sensations. He was born into a family culture of music, and literature. He was reared on Irish ballads, history, and hatred of England. Before he was 12, he was writing newspaper articles, astonishing articles, and poetry such as 
O oh God, why do they mock me with paper freedom under England's crown? Even while they forge another link to bind me, another traitor's chain to drag me down. But God be praised, my lovers are not vanquished. Their arms are strong as steel, their hearts are true. Another day will see my armies marching to strike another blow for Roisin Dhu. Roisin Dhu is an ancient name for Ireland. It means the Black Rose. I think there's a pub here of that name in Boston. I'll be there later, testing the Black Valium, or Guinness as you call it. All his life, Brendan would despise uh, the, the class consciousness and particularly the racism of the British upper classes. In a mock British accent, his nose cocked in the air in supercilious imitation, he would sing this uh, satire, he wrote on British Manifest Destiny and Superiority. I remember in September when the final stumps were drawn and the shouts of crowds now silent and the boys to tea had gone. Let us, O oh Lord above us, still remember simple things When all are dead who love us, or oh, the captains and the kings When all are dead who love us, or oh, the captains and the kings we have many goods for export, Christian ethics and old port. But our finest boast is that the Anglo-Saxon is a sport. On the playing fields of Eton, we still do thrilling things. Do not think we'll ever weaken, oh, the captains and the kings. Do not think we'll ever weaken, oh, the captains and the kings. By the moon that shines above us in the misty morn or night, let us cease to run ourselves down and praise God that we are white. But better still we're English, tea and toast and muffin rings and old ladies with stern faces or the captains and the kings and old ladies with stern faces or the captains and the kings. When Brendan was eight years old, his grandmother, Granny Furlong, gave him the taste for alcohol. She'd send him to the local pub with a big jug to be filled with Guinness. He would drink half of it before he got home and then top it up with water uh, to make up the deficiency. One afternoon, Brendan and his grandmother, uh, they went to visit a friend, only to stagger home close to midnight, roaring drunk. A passerby, uh, seeing Brendan stumbling along, said, Oh, isn't it terrible, ma'am, to see such a beautiful child deformed? Uh, Granny Furlong said, How dare you? He's not deformed. He's simply drunk. When the Beans moved out of the slums of Dublin to a government housing estate under the lee of the mountains, Brendan's mother Kathleen had the idea of uh, having a vegetable garden. And with that in mind... Uh, she imported some, a big, big load of manure. Uh, one day, Stephen, her husband, Brendan's father, uh, came home to this awful smell coming from the back garden. And there was this enormous load of manure covering the entire back garden. And for weeks and weeks, as the stench grew worse, uh, Kathleen nagged Stephen to break out the spade and the fork and dig the manure into the soil. Uh, Stephen felt that such work was beneath him. He remarked... As far as I'm concerned, manual labor is the Spanish ambassador. Finally, when he could no longer stand the nagging, he walked to the nearest public telephone and he called police headquarters and informed them that that notorious family of IRA bombers, the Beans of, uh, of Crumlin, Kildare Road, Crumlin, had guns, ammunition and gelignite buried in the back garden. The next morning, a couple of trucks pulled up outside the Bean household. Out jumped a dozen stout Irish policemen with spades and shovels who spent the rest of the day digging the Bean's back garden. Kathleen was delighted. 
She even made him tea and sandwiches, and that was how she got her, her vegetable garden. Brendan's experience as a convict would be the inspiration for his uh, first play, The Queer Fella, which had its premiere in Dublin in 1954. I was 14 years of age at the time, and I was actually in the theatre. I was working in the theatre. I was an assistant, 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 assistant stage manager. And I remember pulling the curtains up that night. But when the stage lights came up that night, the curtain was raised on the first act of his literary life and on the last act of his actual life. But Brendan wasn't the only writer in the family. Indeed, all the boys wrote well. They wrote fiction plays, biographies and songs. A BBC reporter asked Stephen Bean, uh, Brendan's father, why he didn't produce plays. He replied, I'm too bloody busy producing playwrights. This, uh, Dominic Bean was a, a brother of Brendan's and uh, he was a very fine writer. And a great songwriter, too. This is one of Dominic's. They say that the lakes of Killarney are fair. No stream with the Liffey could ever compare. If it's water you want, you find nothing so rare as the stuff that flows down by the ocean. The sea, oh the sea, it's Grog Al McCree. Long may it roll between England and me. It's a sure guarantee that some hour we'll be free. Thank God we're surrounded by water. Well, the Danes came to Ireland with nothing to do but the dream of the plunder the Irish they slew. Are you willing, your Vikings? said Brian Baru, and he threw them back into the ocean. The sea, oh the sea, it's Grog and McCree. Long may it flow between England and me. It's a sure guarantee that some hour we'll be free. Thank God we're surrounded by water. Well, the Scots have their whiskey, the Welsh have their leeks. Their poets are paid about ten pence a week. Provided no harsh word on England they speak. Oh, Lord, what a price for devotion. The sea, oh, the sea, it's Grog and McCree. Long may it roll between England and me. It's a sure guarantee that some hour we'll be free. Thank God we're surrounded by water. Thank God we're surrounded by water. Patrick Kavanagh, until, until near the end of his days, he lived like a beggar. He used all his persuasion and connections to find regular employment, but his scruffy appearance, his unpredictable, uh, troublemaking nature rendered him unqualified even for menial jobs. I actually saw him one time on Baggot Street begging money from a woman, and a few times he knocked on our door and pleaded with my mother for a sandwich and a cup of tea. For a short while he held the job of a uh, film critic for a Dublin newspaper, and his, some of his critiques were actually written in verse, like this one for Gone with the Wind. Through Gone with the Wind I yawned my way, so I might know what magic lay in this slow story that to its author three million pounds must have brought her. And here's the secret I found in it. Barnum was wrong. There's two every minute. Kavanagh would come to see himself as victim and outcast, feeling he had been trading his very soul and every rejection, every psychic wounding, uh, every heart was poured into a marvellous poem called Pegasus. Maybe you've come across that in the, uh, the talks this week. And in, in, the, in that poem, his soul is paraded in the guise of an old horse. If you haven't read it yet, I recommend it. He didn't write many songs, uh, or two as far as I know. And uh, this is one, at least a fraction of one. We'll do the rest of it later, if ever you go to Dublin town. 
If ever you go to Dublin town in a hundred years or so, inquire for me in Baggett Street and what I was like to know. Ah, he was a queer one, follow the dido, he was a queer one, I tell you. Anyway, we'll do that in a wee while. Brendan Bean and his brother Dominic were bitter rivals. Uh, Brendan jealously sneering at Dominic's literary endeavours, saying, Genius does not come in litters. Uh, the relationship between them was so tumultuous, rancorous, loud and even violent that Kathleen, their mother, was heard to cry out in exasperation one day, Oh, sweet Jesus, would you come down off the cross and let me up there for a few minutes, peace. <laughs> Dominic wrote a fine play called The Patriot Game. It's, uh, and, and the song by the same name. It could be construed, the play and the song, as somewhat anti-nationalist, but nonetheless it's a very fine piece of work. When the play opened in London, in the West End, in a very fine theatre, uh, Brendan was in the front row, and as the play progressed, Br Brendan began to heckle the actors, interrupt, stand up, give his opinion, call it rubbish, and eventually he actually brought the play to a halt. Uh, Brendan was finally dragged out of the theatre and uh, shouting as he went that the play was an insult to all the uh, Republicans who had died for Ireland. Here's the song, it's a great one called The Patriot Game. Come all you young rebels List while I sing For the love of one's country It's a terrible thing It vanishes fear With the speed of a flame It makes us all part of The patriot game my name is O'Hanlon I just turned 16 My home is in Monaghan That's where I was weaned I've learned all my life Cruel England to blame And so I'm a part of Patriot game They told me how Connolly Was shot in the chair His wounds from the battle All bloody and bare His fine body twisted All battered and lay they soon make me part of the Patriot game. And now as I lie here, my body all holds, I think on those traitors who bargained and sold. I wish that my rifle but still do the same to those quizlings who sold out the Patriot A quarrelsome, cantankerous Patrick Kavanagh was barred from the local pubs around Baggett Street. As I was walking down the canal bank one day, he was reclining on the grassy verge and called me over. He put a pound note into my hand and sent me to Mooney's pub to buy him whiskey. He wasn't allowed in there. As I was about to enter the pub, a bunch of local bullies pounced upon me and proceeded to do what bullies did, or bullies do, 
Uh, they grabbed Mr. Cavanagh's pound note, probably his last money. The poor man was as poor as, as a, church mouth, a church mouse, and away they ran, they fled. And I had the unha unhappy experience of having to go back and tell Mr. Cavanagh that his money was no longer in the vicinity. Well, he let out a dreadful roar and made a grab at me, but I was very nimble, and I dashed along the canal bank with Cavanagh hot on my heels. He I was heading for home. And thank God, in those days, nobody closed their hall doors. Our doors were always open because we had nothing worth stealing. So you left your door open. Thank God the hall door was open. I ran in, slammed it in Cavanagh's face. Now, my father was out the back chopping uh, firewood. And he heard the pounding and the cursing coming from the front door. So he, he dashed in uh, with the hatchet still in his hand. Now, my father didn't dislike the eccentrics. I mean, how could he? Dublin was full of them. But he particularly disliked anyone who engaged in public uh, drunkenness and bad behavior. And particularly, he disliked Kavanagh. Uh, he threw open the door. Kavanagh saw the hatchet and ran. My father didn't know what was happening. He didn't know what had happened. He just heard the pounding and cursing. And he dashed after Kavanagh, the hatchet still in his hand. And Kavanagh flew up Herbert Place, long, long Monaghan legs stretching out in mad flight, and my father uh, somewhat behind him. My father was a short man. Uh, the county Monaghan legs won the race. And uh, the incident is an indelible uh, picture in my mind Ireland's greatest living poet in full flight from the Doyle hatchet. Oh, for a video of that. It was only in the last uh, couple of years of his life, 66, 67, that Kavanagh began to earn enough money to live on. And it seems now such a bitter and cruel and unjust irony that his song on Raglan Road the most recorded Irish song of the 80s and the 90s has earned considerable royalties, all paid in the, in the late poet's estate. So Paddy Kavanagh uh, died and got rich. God love him, he must be spinning in his grave. One day I met uh, Brendan Bean, quite drunk he was, on Baggett Street, just outside the Sisters of Mercy convent. He put a half a crown into me hand, uh, saying, come on, Doyle, give us a song. Now, I like, Kavanagh used to ask me to sing too. I preferred singing for Bean because he always gave me money. Anyway, I lashed into a song I'd heard on the radio uh, previously or that day. Put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. All I want is loving you and music, music, music. Well, Cabin uh, Bean grabbed the money back out of me hand and said, Ah, you little bastard, he said. If you're going to sing a song, sing an Irish song or don't body your arse. But he softened somewhat, gave me back the money. He said, come on, sing me a rebel song. So I launched into a marvelous song called The Bold Fenian Men, with which he seemed highly delighted saying to the passers-by, that's my Uncle Pather's song. That's my Uncle Pather's song. Indeed, I found out later, it was written by his Uncle Pather Kearney, who also wrote the Irish National Anthem. By now a small crowd had gathered around us, and the chorus, glory o glory o to the Bothenian men, was echoing uh, around the street. Uh, just then, a convent window flew up, a nun in full regalia stuck her head out the window and shouted at us to please move along and not be destroying the peace of the convent. Brendan had a Guinness bottle in his hand. He shouted up at her, Ah, Mother Mary Aikenhead, the patron saint of aspirin. Is it yourself? And just before he staggered off, he said to her, May all your sons grow up to be bishops. But unfortunately, uh, Brendan Bean evolved into a wild, brawling, and sometimes demonic creature. He put his fame and money to terrible use. And when his voracious appetite for alcohol and public notice made him into a parody of himself, it also transformed him into an exhibitionist who would, in the end, devour himself. On the potholes, someone wistfully twisted the bellows wheel. An old man passing said, can't he make it talk, the melodion? I hid in a doorway and tightened the belt of my box-pleated coat. 
I nicked six nicks in the doorpost with my penknife's big blade. There was a little one for cutting tobacco, and I was six Christmases of age. My father played the melodeon, my mother milked the cows, and I had a prayer like a white rose pinned on the Virgin Mary's blouse. Brendan Bean had remarkable parents, Kathleen and Stephen. Kathleen, whom I knew, was a charming, marvellous woman who would sing at the drop of a hat, or more accurately, at the pulling of a pint. About 30 years ago, I asked her to sing that song of Brendan's, that, that uh, song of hers that Brendan liked best. She thought for a moment and then launched into When All the World Was Young. Unfortunately, I can't for the life of me remember the air. But anyway, it goes, When all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, and every goose a swan, lad, and every lass a queen, Get up upon your big white horse and gaily ride away, for youth must have its fling, lad, and every dog his day. When all the world is old, lad, and all the trees are brown, and all your big high hopes come trembling, tumbling down, go you to your corner, lad, the spent and maimed among. God grant you will find one face there, lad, you loved when you were young. Brendan wrote lots of marvellous songs. I wish I had time to do more of them. But he wrote a great one uh, about some t the time he spent in Mountjoy Prison in Dublin. It's called The Owl Triangle. It's got a great chorus. I'd love you to sing it. Your bit goes. And the owl triangle When jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal A hungry feeling came o'er me stealing And the mice were squealing in my prison cell And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks on the Royal Canal To begin the morning The warders bawling Get up, you bowsy, and clean up your cell And the old triangle Well, jingle, jangle all along the banks on the Royal Canal The screw was peeping, humpy gussy lay sleeping As I sat there dreaming of my girl Sal And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal In the female prison There are seventy-five women And it's up there with them I would love to dwell And the old triangle Where jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal All along the banks of the Royal Canal Hop! Lovely! And that, ladies and gentlemen, is but, but a small part of the story of our five writers. I often wonder, uh, how is it, why is it that such a small island has produced a veritable galaxy of such exceptional talents? I pose the question, but I don't know the answer. Perhaps it's been the insular, uh, claustrophobic island mentality that in part has fostered the need for expression. And I think the many hued land of Ireland itself is inspirational. That ever-changing sky and the angle of the light, to my mind's eye, conspire 
to paint a sense of mystery, an intangible spirituality conducive possibly to dreaming. And when we reflect on the words of the Greek historian Herodotus, who described the Celts as overly fond of words, uh, music and wine, it's safe to say that possibly some things never change. So we'll finish off with a cavern, a song. I gave you a slice of it earlier. It's called If Ever You Go to Dublin Town. Um, before I go, I want to thank uh, she Seamus Connolly, my dear friend. He's not here today. He has to do a concert in Texas, I believe. Uh, thank him for inviting me uh, to, the, to be here. Thank you, Anne, and all the lovely people here uh, for all their hospitality. And uh, on a, I'll end on a commercial note. I'll make it short. My CDs and my book are outside. If they don't sell, my mother can't have the operation. <laughs> it's as simple as that. She gets the money. She insists upon it. If you'd like to go to Ireland, I'll take you. Next year, I'm taking three trips over. Uh, we go around on the, the coach. Uh, we see the country through the, the history, the songs, the poetry, the folklore, the music. Mostly we see it through a haze of Guinness, which is the best way to travel, I can assure you. And the flyers are out there. Uh, you can't come on the one in July. It's already booked out, I'm sorry. But May and October still has seats available. Uh, I'll be out there in a moment if you'd like a, a CD or something. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for coming along today. I never thought I'd be standing here at a Patrick Kavanagh sen seminar, singing uh, his songs and telling his story, especially after what happened with the hatchet incident. Um, shortly, a couple of days after the hatchet incident, I saw him coming down the street and I crossed to the other side to get out of his way. Uh, but he called, you know, he called over to me. He said, uh, he, he said, young Doyle, you're about as useful as a goat genolicers. Now, you know what a goat is. At the time, I didn't know what genolicers meant. I went home to my parents and I asked them, what does the word genolicers mean? They fell down laughing. I have to put this as circumspectly as possible. It's a rude term for part of a man's anatomy. Um, testicles. So, he said I was about as useful as a goat's testicles. So, um, my family let me never, well, for years they never let, let me hear the end of it. And it was a long time before they ever called me Danny again. So I have Patrick Cavanagh to thank for that. I sing, he was a queer one. Fa la la da do, he was a queer one. I tell you, if ever you go to Dublin town in a hundred years or so, Inquire for me in Baggett Street and what I was like to know. Ah, he was a queer one, all on the dido, he was a queer one, I'll tell you. On Pembroke Road, look out for my ghost, dishevelled with shoes untied. Playing through the railings with little children, whose children have long since died. Oh, he was a nice man, all on the dido, he was a nice man, I'll tell you. He had the knack of making men feel as small as they really were, which meant as great as God has made them, as males they dislike his heir. Oh, he was a proud one, all on the dido, he was a proud one, I'll tell you. I saw his name with a hundred others in a book in the library. It said he had never fully achieved his potentiality. Oh, he was slothful, fall on the he was slothful, I'll tell you. He knew posterity had no use for anything but the soul, the lines that speak, the passionate heart, the spirit that lives alone. Ah, he was a lone one, fall on the he was a lone one, I'll tell you. If ever you go to Dublin town in a hundred years or so, Inquire for me in Baggett Street and what I was like to know. Ah, he was a queer one. He was a nice man, fall on the dido. He was a proud one, fall on the dido. He was slothful, fall on the dido. He was a lone one, fall on the dido. He was a lone one, I tell you. Thank you. Good night. God bless you. Thank you, thank you.